Okay, everybody. Good evening. Um, this is super exciting because we're actually having a live in-person lecture ahead of schedule. It feels slightly naughty. Um, so I like things that are slightly naughty, so I'm happy about that. Um, I will go back to what our format <clears throat> has been when we've been doing things live, which is to just note what's up on the screen. Uh, thank Angelica Gallegos, who's a member of the class of 21 for the creation of this map. This is our tribal lands acknowledgement, which you can also find on the school's website. So tonight is going to be a little bit of a hybrid, um, not only of attendees who may be with us via Zoom or in the room here in Hastings Hall, but also of speakers, one of whom is with us in person, that's Michelangelo Sabatino, and one of whom is with us uh, remotely via Zoom from Italy, who is Napoleone Ferrari, who I can see here, but you can't, but you will see him shortly. Um, so I want to welcome you both and uh, welcome all of our guests tonight, both far away and here in the room. Um, Napoleone Ferrari earned a degree in philosophy with a specialization in aesthetics from the University of Turin. In 1999, he co-founded the Musea Casa Molino together with Fulvio Ferrari. Um, and since that time, he has been working to gather the vast archives concerning every aspect of Carlo Molino's life and work. He's the author of nine books on Molino. He also co-curated the 2006 uh, Molino retrospective held in Turin's Gallery of Modern Art. He is currently the president of the Museo Casa Molino, and he recently co-authored Carlo Molino, Architect and Storyteller with Michelangelo Sabatino, I'm delighted to say. So, Michelangelo Sabatino is an architectural historian, curator, and preservationist whose research and writing focuses primarily on modern architecture and the built environment more broadly. He's a professor of architectural history and cultural heritage at IIT's College of Architecture, where he directs their PhD program. And he's also the inaugural John Vinci, if I wrote that down correctly, Distinguished Research Fellow. Uh, Sabatino has written a number of important books on modern architecture, including one titled Pride in, in Modesty, Modernist Architecture and the Vernacular Tradition in Italy, which won a number of awards, including the Society of Architectural Historians Alice Davis Hitchcock Award, which is great. And of course, uh, his new book with uh, Mr. Ferrari on Carlo Molino, which I have, I got an early copy, and it's superb, and I highly recommend it. So their joint talk tonight um, is titled Modern Eclecticism, Carlo Molino, Architect and Designer. But before um, they start, I do want to say this. Uh, those of you who are members of the school's population have seen this going in, particularly if you've come to the third floor or had classes on the second floor. Um, in the school's gallery, we have a new exhibition up. Uh, it is on loan from the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and it's called Radical Italian Design 1965 to 1985, the Dennis Friedman Collection. Now, I'm happy to say that Dennis Friedman is here um, to both enjoy the lecture and enjoy seeing his work in our gallery. Uh, we will be having a proper opening when we're allowed to serve beverages without masks on. Um, but for right now, we have a wonderful lecture that connects to the work of that era and that country. Uh, the Friedman Collection uh, was based on, and you'll read more about it if you go to the gallery, um, the various turbulent global events of uh, the 60s uh, when young Italian architects and designers focused on developing solutions to issues rather than contributing to what they viewed as a corrupt system. Um, I think you could say that it altered the costs of avant-garde architectural thought and design, expanded the definition of what architects do. Um, and I will just, it is an extraordinary show. We are really thrilled uh, to have it here. And so what we're going to do tonight, um, even though we can't really have an opening given the university's current regulations, is we're going to keep the gallery open until eight o'clock and when this lecture ends, I encourage everybody to go to the second floor to see the show and then to come back uh, when we have our opening. If you're in school here, visit it often. It is inspirational. 
Uh, and if you're joining this lecture remotely, uh, please come to New Haven to see the exhibition. And um, with that, I want to welcome Napoleone and Michelangelo to give their talk. And thank you all who came downstairs um, for, for this, our live lecture. Are you ready to welcome everyone? Yes. I, you go first. No, you can say hello and uh, I will then proceed. <laughs> okay. So good evening to everybody. And thank you for this invitation and opportunity to present Carlo Molino. Uh, I am in Turin, uh, sitting uh, in the apartment that Molino designed for himself in the early 1960s. And seen from this point of view, and from Italy, Molino's rich personality easily falls into the tradition of the Italian Renaissance polymath artist type. And, and that is why his work today is particularly convincing, since throughout his life, uh, he was able to combine the technical education he mainly received from his very successful structural engineer father with his own artistic penchant. But uh, so since I do not wish to create any slowdown because of my spoken Italian English, uh, Michelangelo and I decided that he will read the lecture. So let's leave to Michelangelo the storytelling. <laughs> Thank you, my dear friend, Napoleone. <laughs> I will let, sorry, uh, Trevor. Well, well, thank you, Dean Burke, uh, for your kind introduction. Special thanks to my Yale colleagues for their ongoing friendship and support. And to those Molino fans who are joining us from afar, thank you for your dedication. Paul Rudolph once wrote that we need caves as well as goldfish bowls. As someone who spends a lot of time in a Mies van der Rohe designed a, a fish bowl, I'm happy to be here this evening with you in Rudolph's uh, cave. I see a lot going on on my screen, but it, I, I should pay attention to this and not get dizzy with that. Uh, so, voila, thank you, Trevor, who's an IIT grad, uh, so we're happy to have you here. Uh, in this staged self-portrait taken in 1942, Carlo Molino looks at us with a mischievous gaze, as if almost daring us to question his intentions as he flies over New York with an airship just beyond his reach. This evening, we hope to explore Molina's life and work with the help of an oxymoron, modern eclecticism, which, with which he identified. This self-identification with seemingly incompatible realities is one of the reasons why his multifaceted contributions as an architect and designer went largely misunderstood or downright ignored by militant modernists who were all too anxious to oversimplify his complexities and contradictions. Neither anti-modern nor anti-traditional, Molino drew as freely from the avant-garde movements such as surrealism, futurism, and expressionism as he did from alpine vernacular traditions or the Baroque architecture of Turin, the northern Italian city where he was born and worked throughout his entire life. To advance, it doesn't seem to be, in oh, voila, okay. Shortly after the end of the Second World War, when Molino was just 41 years old, he proudly writes, and I quote, eclecticism, I do not fear this scandalous word, through which a house expresses not the collector's necrophilia or snobbery for his own, its own sake, but a desire to evoke at every hour art forms from all times as comprehensible as those of today, while being in control of them and declaring oneself comfortably present in one's own times. This perilous adventure of modern eclecticism should not be confused with that of the late 19th century, 
regrettably still alive, end quote. With these words in mind, we will examine a series of interiors, objects, and buildings through which we hope to demonstrate how Molino intentionally placed seemingly conflicting approaches in dialogue in order to achieve his modern eclecticism. The Horse Riding Club of Turin, completed in 1940, is Molino's early masterpiece. And the first example that we present is concrete evidence that Molino drew upon multiple conceptual, spatial, and material strategies for his modern eclecticism, which he considered a process of synthesis. Here on the right, we see a photomontage with the main entrance and note how Molino takes cues from his Italian rationalist peers while pushing the end results. To the crisp rectangular lines and abstract volumes, he adds a movement of the curved entrance canopy. This photomontage with a rearing horse enhances the surreal quality of the building, which appears as an enchanted chateau where the act of riding a horse takes on a fairy tale-like quality. To the left is a rare color photo. We see how Molino deploys Renaissance-inspired red rusticated stoneware positioned so that it appears floating above glass blocks, threatening to crush them beneath its weight. As we scroll through the numerous images produced by Molino of the Horse Riding Club, Sadly, the building has, was demolished in the 1960s, well before Docomomo was around to crusade against such uh, travesties. Uh, we sense here different languages being surprisingly merged to accomplish a new overall effect. This approach accounts for the great linguistic variety within Molino's architectural oeuvre. Sometimes his buildings look as if they were designed by a different architect. In this set of images, we see some of the ways that Molino contrasts orthogonal and curvilinear interior and exterior shapes and surfaces within the same building. Before traveling to Turin, let's detour to New York, a city that excited Molino's imagination from early on, even though he visited near the end of his life. Between 1950 and 1972, New York hosted two important, albeit substantially different, types of exhibitions focused on Italian design. Italy at Work, the Renaissance in Design Today, opened at the Brooklyn Museum uh, and featured our seasonal alongside architect-designed objects and interiors. 20 years later, and only one year before Molina's death, Italy, the new domestic landscape, opened at MoMA and ushered in experimental scenarios that were emerging thanks to new generations of architects and designers. Italy at Work, was conceived as a traveling exhibition for 12 American museums between 1953, 1950 and 53, and was part of a broader post-Second World War American cultural and uh, geopolitical strategy. The press release that accompanied the opening of the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, stated, and I quote, the director of the Bro Brooklyn Museum points out that the museum visitor can actually see what America's help to Italy has achieved, he says, this very activity America has fostered has been a strong instrument in teaching men who have lived under totalitarianism the desirability of democracy. This has been a prime factor in stopping communism in Italy in its own tracks. End of quote. Today, I suspect quite a few would disagree with this assessment, but let us move forward. The degree with which old and new know-how appear to coexist in the Italy at Work exhibition is best served in the center here, uh, uh, of the space on top of this left, on the left hand photo, where the soon to be iconic Lambretta can be seen in close proximity to a traditional wooden Sicilian cart displayed just around the corner and barely visible. An Italy at work exhibition goer would have been hard pressed to imagine that Molino's plywood, maple, and brass vertebrae dining table seen here on the left at the center of the room in a period photo and on the right in a close-up contemporary photograph taken some 70 years later would have garnered six million dollars during a New York City Papa Lee's auction in 2020. Students, how's that for designing uh, chairs and uh, that will uh, garner you a lot of money? Before traveling to, sorry, um, the table was accompanied by six chairs. 
their plywood back and seat ergonomically follow the contours of the human body. The back is slightly swinging. For Molino, chairs are a microcosm of architecture that bodies inhabit. He is part of a long tradition of Italian architects who are deeply committed to designing interiors and furniture. The chair support is made of a single continuous piece of steel in the manner of Alexander Calder's surface figures. The virtuoso design can be seen in the drawing to the right. Another chair designed by Molino for the Italy at Work exhibition is made of elements that can be produced separately in an economic machine-made manner or more elaborately hand-shaped and subsequently assembled. Especially interesting are the black plywood inserts fixed with brass nails without the use of glue that join the legs. Both the plywood back and seat rest on rubber pads that allow for oscillation. The third and last chair in the exhibition belongs to the 1940s sculptural phase of Molina's work. The chair was described as such in a House and Garden article published in December 1950, and I quote, slender as the legs of an antelope, the legs of this willowy desk chair support a frame, joined throughout without glue, end quote. Although the Molino drawing in the lower right-hand corner is not directly related to the chair uh, design, it belongs to his repertoire of drawings and sketches. In order to develop his daring and unconventional furniture, like the one displayed at Italy at work, Molino relied upon a group of artisans in Turin, like those at Apelli e Varesio, whose workshop we see here with a variation of the vertebrae table under construction in the bottom left-hand corner. While Molina was interested in the possibilities of mass production, he ultimately gravitated toward a practice that privileged the design and production of handmade unique pieces and limited series. It is worth noting that Molina was both cosmopolitan and deeply connected to his local and regional context. He deeply respected the artisans, artisan collaborators using regional Piedmontese dialect to engage with them on their own terms. For those of you who have visited or plan to visit the fabulous radical exhibition here at Yale, and I hope those who are joining us virtually will also do so before it comes down, you will see a number of objects on view, such as the Pratone, the giant uh, polyurethane blades of grass, and the reclining capital uh, are part of this Guzman catalog. To the left is the Detecma, the first chair in history designed with a computer. Guzman, like Apelli of Arezzo, is another Turinese company simultaneously experimenting with vanguard and artisanal techniques. A combination of highly flexible production methods typical of Italy relates to both Molino's designs and those of the radicals. A perceptive author of an article published in the December 1950 issue of House and Garden was quick to point out Molino's unique contribution, and I quote, the furniture of architect designer Carlo Molino of Turin, which you see on these four pages, is a brilliant summation of the principal facets of Italian design. It belongs to no school, subscribes to no isms. It is a vivid and personal and free from personal, uh, preconceived forms." In an article in the Magazine of Art by MoMA curator Edgar Kaufman Jr., published in January 1951, shortly after he launched his Good Design program, uh, he places images of Molino's living dining room opposite his roll-top desk and chair below one of Lucio Fontana's sculptures. If we fail to look carefully at the black and white period photo on the right, uh, it is easy to miss the exceptional quality of Molino's designed objects and interiors that are situated to the right and at the far end amongst artisanal and industrially produced objects. So here's Molino and here's Molino. And this is a close. Uh, coming to light through the color photo, Molino's living and dining room for a modern income family appears replete with a folding table, movable light fixture, green armchairs and a sofa bed in front of a life-size view of an outdoor stream. Here, Molino interprets an economic living program by strategically focusing on compactness and ingenious use of affordable materials and visual props aimed at expanding space. 
just as we might be tempted to associate this moderate income interior with the austerity of existence minimum, Molino confuses our expectations by introducing a dramatic photographic enlargement of a 19th century print by the landscape artist Heinrich Böhmen behind mullions that simulate window frames. It is the same type of blow up that we saw behind Napoleon's back uh, in the living room in Molino's Turin dwelling. The print, seen here without the mullions, draws our attention to one of the most important themes that informs Molino's life and work, the interrelationship between architecture, design, and nature. During the same years in which Italy at work traveled throughout the US, George Everhard Peter Smith, the architect, author, photographer, and occasional Yale School of Architecture visiting critic, was competing, completing his groundbreaking Italy Builds, its modern architecture and native inheritance. It was published in 1955 with an introduction by Ernesto Nathan Rogers. Peter Smith, much to the delight of Yale historian Vincent Scully, provocatively presents modern architecture alongside Italy's classical vernacular and urban traditions. In this book, Peter Smith wrote thus about the Lagonero sled station just west of Turin that opened in 1947, and I quote, Molino, the oft times bad boy of contemporary architecture, has here realized his finest work. At the Lago Nero sled station, Molino boldly combines a reinforced concrete structure with cutting edge Virendel trusses and a traditional alpine block bow construction technique. On its two opposite ends, the building appears boldly geometrical and aerodynamically curved. Here, modern eclecticism is both conceptual, material, and structural. Molino often described this building as an aircraft waiting to take flight. Molino's embrace of modern eclecticism informs many aspects of his life and work. In addition to being an architect, he's a skier, a photographer, a writer and teacher, a car designer, and an aerobatics pilot. Molino's love of movement and machines squarely aligns him with the futurists. Here we see him in a self-portrait on the left as he studies ski movements in the basement of his family villa in the early 1940s. To the right, is the cover of his technical manual, Introduction to Downhill Skiing, written during the wartime and published in 1950. In 1955, Molino designed the Bisiluro car to at, compete rather, at the 24 hours of Le Mans. He designed the car structure making use of welded aluminum tubes. The aerodynamic exterior body of the car was realized by, in aluminum by Rocco Motto, a Turin-based producer who manufactured several cars for Raymond Mulloy. In the color photo to the far left, the car is seen on the Le Mans track on the 10th of June, 1955. In the center, the car is tested at the Monza track, and on the right, we see Molino as pilot. In 1956, Molino received his pilot's license and began studying aerobatics and taking part in national and international competitions in the early 1960s. These two photos hung in Molino's studio. They featured Bucher biplanes and were shot at the Ponte Tro airport in Switzerland, where Molino learned aerobatics, not aer acrobatics. So this is a term that I learned uh, through my work on our work on women. To understand Mol Molina's work, it is necessary to understand his life. From New York, where we started, we need to return to Turin. While Molino fueled his imagination with travels across geographies and time, he was deeply tied to the dialogue between the arts and industry that made Turin an important creative hub in Italy and Europe. In Turin, more than most historic Italian cities, with the exception of Milan, the infrastructure of modern industry coexisted seamlessly within uh, the border of the historic city. The, this dimension did not escape Siegfried Gideon, who, in an article published on Italian contemporary architecture in 1931, see to the right, overlays an image of the Fiat radial engine over an interior view of Guarino Guarini's San Lorenzo Cupola, 
seen here next to another Guarini masterpiece in Turin, Palazzo Carignano. The acclaimed Fiat Lingotto factory by Matte Trucco, completed in 1923 in Turin, was 600 feet long, with a, 600 yards long, with a testing track on the roof. During the interwar years, it was a symbol of fascist ingenuity, even though it was realized under a totally different political regime. Fiat 500 automobiles are seen here in Piazza San Carlo in 1957. Turin was at the center of the so-called Italian miracle. It jump-started with the help of the American Marshall Plan. During the first decades of the 20th century, Turin was an important epicenter of avant-garde experimentation, art, literature, and film within Italy. Giorgio de Chirico pointed to Turin as one of the main sources for the invention of his metaphysical art. He made explicit reference to Turin in several of his very early paintings, such as the two seen here, to the left, the Red Tower of 1913, and to the right, Turin Spring in 1914. This 1935 installation, realized together with his friend painter Italo Clamin Cromona for a collective exhibition, clearly marks the beginning of the surreal phase in Molina's work, only a few years after graduating from architecture school. Here we see how Bay incorporated the first issue of Minotaur with a Picasso collage on the cover into a three-dimensional composition that uses a series of symbolic elements. Casa Miller was completed in 1936 and is the first interior design by Molina. It is an experimental space which serves as his own studio and photographic set. It is an interior, it, in this interior, he investigates the possibility of merging the language of different elements such as fabrics, carpets, leopard skins, with symbolic objects such as a shell or bronze eagle head mounted on a wall. Here, industrial and natural elements coexist within centrally, a centrally colored environment. Each piece of the living room furniture conveys the idea of movement, both symbolically and physically. This is best exemplified by two technically advanced designs. The advanced, the advanced uh, lamp sliding on the ceiling, you see here, uh, on a ceiling track in a, sw a swiveling gas glass case cantilevered on metal supports and tension cables that we see here. The photo to the right is his friend Lena gazing into the suspended glass case located in the Casa Miller. It is filled with symbolic and central objects and best materializes his idea of technology brought into a magical and peculiarly human realm. Notice how he signs a photo on the bottom right. Fairy Tales for Grown-Ups is the title of the photo signed by Molino of Lina in a satin dress emerging like the Botticelli Venus from the metaphysical inbuilt cabinet of our unconscious, together with fragments of memories stacked within. Through, separate pla through a, a series of plaster casts of a horse head and a female foot, female foot Molino draws some of the elements of his composition from the Max Ernst repertoire, and at the same time from an ancient Greek ruin. Photography is used by Molino as a contemporary form of expression. It offers him the possibility to shape with precision his unique vision of the interior space that is both modern and surreal. Photography and the study of the body go hand in hand for Molino. Photography was a lifelong activity and passion as his engineer father acquainted him with the camera when he was a young child. The 444 pages of his seminal book, Messaggio from the Message from the Dark Room, Messaggio della Cona Oscura, written during the war and published in 1949, accounts for the knowledge and familiarity he had with the media. Photography reinforces Molino's interest in investigating forms while at the same time offering a creative medium to convey the message. Here, a double spread of the book is dedicated to photographer Edward Weston. Molino seems constantly in search of a relationship between architecture and the human body, functionally and symbolically. 
He especially appreciates the elegance of the female body, whether while referencing Salvador Dali's Venuses on the left, or connecting to the Retrugian tradition as seen in a photo of Lino holding an enigmatic hybridized capital. In his interiors for Casa de Valle, completed in 1940, Molino sets up an Amiric dining room for two sophisticated lovers. The chair support and outline is designed by a white steel rod with a white steel rod metaphorically shaped as a flying butterfly. On this structure are fixed the black and seat upholstered with tufted green velvet and red glass buttons encircled with a polished brass frame. The table with its thick marble side supports seems as an esoteric, if not mas Masonic concentration of symbols. Molino exploits the pediment of a Greek temple to crown the sliding doors of a modernist brass and tempered glass case hung to the wall. White plaster fragments of Greek architecture and sculpture punctuate the wall and glass case. As we see in a number of radical objects on display here in the Yale Gallery, classicism is one of the targets of the radicals who used it in a provocative and oftentimes ironic way. Here at the bottom left, we see the capital armchair produced by Buffram and on view upstairs. Just don't sit on it because Dennis will get very upset. In the same interior for De Valle, De Valle, a textile producer and dealer, Molino designs a bedroom clad with fabrics. The sofa, which serves for dressing and undressing at the feet of the bed, is part of a design that references Salvador Dali's May West lifts sofa realized in 1937. Surrealism an art form which links the work of Molino to the radicals, to be sure. In the lower right photo, we see the lift sofa, also produced by Guzman. Molino carries the artwork of Dali into a functional design object, beautifully shaped, detailed, and proportioned. In the lower photo, we see a contemporary reconstruction of the De Valle bedroom uh, uh, that offers a, an idea, if not exact, of the colors used in Molino's design. Gio Ponti devoted uh, an, the cover in a 13-page article to Casa de Valle in the May 1941 issue of Stile, seen here to the right. In 1941, Melino first moved into the shoes of an architect who also writes about the past. He published an article on structural engineer Alessandro Antonelli, who designed the mall in turn between 1863 and 1889. At the time, it was considered the world's tallest brick building. This was a pivotal moment in Molina's career, shifting his attention to the organic, which he understood in reference to the structures of nature, whether animal or plant organisms. From his early surrealist phase, Molino enters an organic one in which surrealism is not abandoned, but it becomes part of a more nuanced uh, approach. On the left is a photo showing the reticular structure of the Ephesus used by Molino to illustrate his essay on Antonelli, Enchantment and Determination of Antonelli. In the center, the mole, by Antonelli just after bombings in turn in 1943. To the right is a table designed in 1946 for Casa Minola. It is one of the best examples of animal-like sculpted ebony wood objects. Metaphorically, the table stood in front of a wall covered by photographic enlargements of the forest and stream. Between 1944 and 1950, Molino designed many pieces of furniture which, year after year, show the development of his interpretation of the organic. In 1950, he considered this research complete and moved on to the use of plywood while simplifying the outlines of his designs. A few years later, in 1954, he substantially stopped designing furniture. The trestle table for Casa Rivetti on the far left was first manufactured in 1949 and is one of Molino's iconic designs. It is a synthesis of a logical structure merged with an expressive quality. The table is made of wooden struts and ties accurately sculpted, thicker where structurally needed and thinner where possible, joined together by brass nuts and bolts. 
The holes cut into the legs of the table lighten and strengthen the structure, just as it occurs in the bamboo cane seen here, uh, drawn by Molino to illustrate his book, Architecture, Art and Technique, published in 1947. To the right, we see a recent photo of the table designed for the Associazione Culturale Italiana and manufactured in 1949. We see how the table possesses the dynamic tension of a living creature and the elegance of a greyhound, a truly three-dimensional sculpture. Another tradition from which Molino liked to draw is that of the Alpine Walser people living between Italy and Switzerland. The top right photo of a typical vernacular house was taken by Molino in 1930 when preparing a seminal, if unpublished, study of Walser architecture. In the Casa del Sole, the left, a building, a tall building realized for the Alps between 1945 and 54, Molino absorbs that particular typology, transforming it into a grid-like modernist concrete supporting structure on the man, main facade. In the lower right photo, the Casa del Sole stands yeah, in Cervinia, it, it stands in proximity to another remarkable reinterpretation of traditional mountain architecture by Franco Albini, so-called Rifugio Pirovano, completed in 1951. The oblique facade of the Casa del Sole, seen here on your right, in a wonderful photo by Pino Musi, who uh, took, uh, who we commissioned to uh, uh, take uh, the complete, the work, the photographs of the complete works, uh, is made of precast concrete elements held together by specifically cast adjustable iron joints. From the micro scale of the facade to the micro scale, macro scale of the facade to the micro scale of the interior furniture, Molino plays on the same theme. The bed seen here on the left can be used singularly or stacked on top of each other, fixed with polished brass mechanical-like joints. This bed is one of the most architectural of Molina's designs. It functions as a small machine at habité, with its folding tables suspended beside uh, bedside tables and sliding coat hangers manufactured in formica and oak. Casa Catana, open, completed in 1953, on a panoramic hill highland site overlooking the Lago Maggiore appears as a reptile crouched on its two forward legs. The glazed roof tiles, originally bright green and mustard color, build on the same idea of animal scales and skin. Rib-like reinforced concrete beams support the balcony and the overhanging roof. Structurally, the house consists of a hybrid truss whose upper part, concealed under the roof, sustains the central suspended part of the building. The modernist structure and the expressive quality of the house are camouflaged by traditional mountain architectural elements such as stone and wood. The interiors of the Casa Catano fall into a latter and, and more simplified phase of Molina's work. Um, the walls of this dining area are clad with vertical wooden planks and the furniture is more straightforward. The only exception at the Casa Catano is a plywood chair designed in 1953, which looks like an origami toy obtained from a single sheet of plywood being bent over and over and kept together with brass fittings. The back and seat are sculpted, making visible the different layers of the plywood. In fact, the design for such a chair is not possible to achieve with a single plywood board but what fascinates Molino is the challenge of simulating a single continuous organic body. The largest architectural body designed by Molino that reflects his pursuit of modern eclecticism is the Royal Opera House Turin, completed in 1973, shortly before his death. As suggested by the drawing on the left, the curved lines of the building planks pay homage to the Baroque of Guarino Guarini, but also resemble those of a woman's profile. The curtain wall corresponds to the space of the foyer, while the brick wall hides the part of, in which the stage is located. The opera house is adjacent to the main square of Turk, among a number of historic Baroque buildings. 
Molino connects to this tradition by using exposed brick for its outer walls, as is common throughout the city. For the exterior wall at the Teatro Reggio, Molino made use of the eight-point star, a symbol recurrent in Turin for centuries. Here, he creates a work of optical art by layering the bricks on three different levels on the wall. One level is a, of stars engraved into the wall, the second level is a flat wall, while the third is made of stars juxtaposed on top of the flat wall. In so doing, Molino was able to dematerialize the otherwise heavy wall surface by a play of light and shadow. Molino employs a similar strategy of light and shadow with the D70 couch produced by Tecno, designed by Osvaldo Borsani, who is seen here sitting on his own design. A modern couch, which can be opened with a simple mechanism to become a bed, is transformed by Molino on the right with its black leather tufted upholstery into a hybrid object, half modern and half traditional. On the left is the foyer of the Opera House, a semicircular open space on four different levels. Exposed reinforced concrete V-shaped structures support the crossing of the staircase and walkways into space. The structure left much of these pathways flowing, suspended with only two columns, by only two columns that contain the elevators. The auditorium is a velvet lease, uh, uh, is a velvety space inspired by the form of an egg. From the wood ceiling designed for acoustic reflection hang about 6,000 plexiglass rods shaped as prisms in between 1,732 light bulbs. Molino used indigo color, a spiritual symbol for intuition, to carry the attention of the spectator to the proscenium, which architecturally mediates the curved shape of the auditorium with the rectangular shape of the stage. While the Teatro Reggio is his last major work, we would like to leave you this evening with one intimate interior that is a manifesto of Molino's lifelong exploration of modern eclecticism. In his apartment, realized between 1960 and 1968, within a 19th century Turin villa located along the Po River, Molino perilously played with a number of different objects and styles. Saarinen coexists next to uh, ancient shells, next to Japanese um, lamps. He aimed at creating an interior space suspended in time rather than being traceable to a specific period, surely not the 1960s that were characterized by radical sensitivities. Approaching the end of his life, Molino's disquietude increased he felt even more urgently the necessity to, and I quote, evoke art forms from all time, end quote, to signify his belonging to the human historic process and to confirm his lifelong commitment to modern eclecticism. Thank you. We leave you with the image of our new book, hoping that you will be sort of intrigued enough to join us in New York City uh, on May 9th from 6 to 8 at the Center for Architecture on the Guardia Place. Grazie a tutti e buonanotte.